Hello everybody, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at two high yield neurology topics that crop up in final exams. So we're going to be looking at hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus and becoming a little bit more confident in distinguishing between the two different diseases. So before we begin, I just want to share a little bit about the Medicine Guide. So the Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel with free online videos which aims to help support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've got videos on how to be successful in medical school and tips and tricks on how to approach anatomy, CBL, histology and PBL. I've also got videos focusing on the high yield topics that crop up in final exams, such as imaging, obs and gynae, paediatrics, cardiology, and this video in conjunction with others is part of my high yield neurology edition. So if you enjoy my video today and if you found my previous videos helpful, then please could I ask you to kindly like my video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that we're going to be comparing and contrasting normal pressure hydrocephalus and hydrocephalus. So the approach we're going to take is that we're going to have a brief overview of the two diseases. Then we're going to be focusing on the risk factors, signs and symptoms, test investigations, and finally the management. And throughout the entire video, we'll be comparing the two pathologies. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's begin with discussing a hydrocephalus. So with a hydrocephalus, the two key points I want you to remember when you're thinking about this disease is that these patients will have excessive CSF volume, so that cerebrospinal fluid volume, found within the ventricular system of the brain. And patients who are presenting with a hydrocephalus typically present with symptoms of raised intracranial pressure. Okay? Now, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, these patients have got a reduced CSF absorption at their arachnoid villi, and therefore they will present with reversible dementia. So they'll present with symptoms of reversible dementia. And another key point to remember of normal pressure hydrocephalus is these patients will have a normal intracranial pressure. Okay? So that's two pieces of information that you need to be really clear about when you're thinking about a hydrocephalus compared to a normal pressure hydrocephalus, okay? So let's just familiarize ourselves with the pathway of CSF. So CSF is produced by the choroid plexus. So this could be the choroid plexus found in the lateral ventricle, third ventricle, or the fourth ventricle. Now, in this example, let's focus on the choroid plexus found in the lateral ventricle. So CSF is produced by the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle. The CSF will then flow into the third ventricle via the interventricular foramina and then into the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct and then into the subarachnoid space via the lateral and median apertures and then into the arachnoid villi of the dual venous sinuses and finally it will drain into the venous blood and be transported into the heart and lungs. Now, the key thing about CSF is that one of the functions of CSF is to help lubricate and protect the brain. OK, so that's just a nice brief overview. So going back to the key pathologies, so we're looking at hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now, a hydrocephalus can present in three different ways. It can present as an obstructive or a non-communicating hydrocephalus. It can present as a non-obstructive hydrocephalus and finally as a congenital hydrocephalus. So firstly, an obstructive hydrocephalus or a non-communicating hydrocephalus is when there is some obstruction leading to dilation of the ventricular system and CSF is going to accumulate behind the obstruction. So examples of this can involve a tumour, a subarachnoid haemorrhage, an intraventricular haemorrhage or aqueduct stenosis, all leading to an obstruction, leading to dilation of the ventricular system and CSF accumulation. And these are examples of how an obstructive or a non-communicating hydrocephalus can develop. Now let's look at a non-obstructive hydrocephalus. So this is when we've got blockage of the CSF after it's exiting the ventricles. 
but CSF can still flow between the ventricles. So this might arise from a choroid plexus tumour, meningitis or an artery malformation. And finally, we have a congenital hydrocephalus. So this might arise from preeclampsia or alcohol abuse during pregnancy. OK. Now let's look at a normal pressure hydrocephalus. So the risk factors for developing a normal pressure hydrocephalus. So a normal pressure hydrocephalus can be idiopathic. It's commonly found in the elderly, so a classic SBA will involve an elderly patient. It can arise from a subarachnoid hemorrhage. It might arise from trauma or even from meningitis. OK, so those are the key risk factors that you need to be aware of. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms. So hydrocephalus, these patients will present classically with signs of raised intracranial pressure. So typically the SBA will involve a patient complaining of a headache, which is worse first thing in the morning. They'll also be complaining of nausea and vomiting. They might even be in a state of a coma. And on fundoscopy, you will see signs of papilledema, so blurring of the optic disc. Now, these are signs of raised intracranial pressure in an adult. The signs of raised intracranial pressure in a child is as below. A wide bulging fontanelle, increased head circumference, prominent scalp veins, and what's described as sunset eyes. So sunset eyes are when the patient's eyes are deviated downwards and they have a failure of gazing upwards. And these are some of the key classic findings you need to be aware of and you need to be comfortable in picking out when there is an SBA involving hydrocephalus. OK, now let's look at a normal pressure hydrocephalus. So like I said, it's classically found in elderly patients. So these elderly patients typically present with this triad of urinary incontinence, dementia and what's known as a magnetic gait. So this is when the patient's feet are seemingly stuck on the floor with smaller strides. So just be aware of that because that's a very key classic description which crops up in SBAs. So this triad can be referred to more commonly as wet, wacky and wobbly. So wet, so patients presenting with normal pressure hydrocephalus suffer from urinary incontinence. So that's wet, wacky, unfortunately is describing patients suffering from dementia because they'll be very confused and wobbly describes the magnetic gait. So you can either remember this triad as urinary incontinence, dementia, magnetic gait, or you can remember this triad as wet, wacky, wobbly, whichever you feel more comfortable in using, whichever you feel is more helpful. But please remember normal pressure hydrocephalus presents in classically elderly patients reversible signs of dementia. So the dementia will be reversed. So the confusion is what it's really referring to will be reversed once the normal pressure hydrocephalus has been resolved. OK, so remember wet, wacky, wobbly, and it's classically found in elderly patients. OK. So now let's look at the tests. So Hydrocephalus, you need to do a CT head for first line. So as we've discussed previously, there's lots of different forms in which a hydrocephalus can present. And the classic finding that we need to exclude in the CT head is that we need to exclude an obstructive hydrocephalus. And that's why we're performing the CT head. We can also consider an MRI and essentially to diagnose and offer therapeutic value as well, we need to perform a lumbar puncture in these patients. Now a lumbar puncture is contraindicated in patients who have an obstructive hydrocephalus, so that's why it's really, really important that we do a CT head first line to exclude an obstructive hydrocephalus. Because if you perform a lumbar puncture in patients who have an obstructive hydrocephalus, it leads to herniation of the cerebellar tonsils because it induces a negative pressure within the lumbar system, pulling the cerebellar tonsils downwards through the frame magnum, and that can lead to coning and death. So it's really, sorry, coning and death. So it's really, really important that you perform a CT head first line to exclude an obstructive hydrocephalus, 
Once obstructive hydrocephalus is excluded, we perform a lumbar puncture for our key diagnostic investigation. OK, now let's look at a normal pressure hydrocephalus. So again, we need to do a CT head first line to exclude for signs of an obstructive hydrocephalus. And in a normal pressure hydrocephalus, the CT head can show an enlarged full ventricle without atrophy of the sulci and increased signal intensity around the ventricles. But I think the key thing for you to remember for normal pressure hydrocephalus is again, do you CT head first line to exclude for an obstructive hydrocephalus? Okay. Once the CT head has excluded an obstructive hydrocephalus, we can perform a lumbar puncture. Now, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, we perform a lumbar puncture and we offer volume removal of 50 millilitres of CSF fluid because after performing this removal of CSF fluid, if the patient's gait improves, then it's very likely that they're suffering from a normal pressure hydrocephalus and therefore we can perform the definitive management for a normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is a ventricular peritoneal shunt. OK, so let's look at the management in a bit more detail. So in a hydrocephalus, we can initially perform an external ventricular drain. So this is when we're draining the CSF fluid at the patient's bedside. And the next step up to this would be to perform a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So this is more long term management and we're draining and diverting the CSF from the ventricles into the abdominal peritoneum. And lastly, we can consider surgery to remove any obstructing pathology in a patient presenting with an obstructive hydrocephalus. OK, now in a normal pressure hydrocephalus, as I alluded to in the previous slide, the ventricular peritoneal shunt is the definitive treatment. So after performing the 50 millilitres fluid removal with the lumbar puncture, if the patient's gait improves, then this means that they're likely to be suffering from a normal pressure hydrocephalus. So a ventricular peritoneal shunt would be beneficial in these patients. OK, now, if you're unsure about what an external ventricular drain or a ventricular peritoneal shunt looks like, we'll have a look at that in the next slide. So just to clarify, this two, these are two forms of treatment which are only used exclusively for a hydrocephalus. So we've got the external ventricular drain where we're draining CSF from the lateral ventricles, and this is all performed at the patient's bedside. Now, a ventricular peritoneal shunt is when we're draining the excess CSF from the lateral ventricles and it's being diverted into the peritoneal cavity. So, this is more of a surgical management or a surgical procedure, the ventricular peritoneal shunt. Okay. So this is the end of my video today. Hopefully you found the video really useful. And if you've enjoyed my video today and you've enjoyed my previous videos, please can I ask you to like my video, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And thank you very much for joining me today. And I wish you all the best with your exams.